This week, uh, we'll be talking about uh, explicit operation within Vulkan um, and how it helps achieve consistent frame times and what mechanisms are within Vulkan to actually achieve that. So again, just get through the introduction. Uh, I'm Tobias. I've been working in imagination for five years, uh, four years in DevTech. I'm now working on Vulkan extensions. Uh, and I've been working on Vulkan since its inception. Um, and I've also been developing extensions for AS as well. This series is looking at uh, Chronos' newest standard Vulkan for graphics. Uh, I won't be giving any more information about the API as per usual. That is up to Chronos to make announcements. I would literally be giving insight into various features. So there's my the original uh, Birds of Feather talk at SIGGRAPH uh, was the original review, and I'm basically expanding on that. And this week, as I already said, I'll be talking about explicit operation within Vulkan, what that actually means. So there's a lot of things that OpenGLES and older APIs do uh, that can be issues, um, usually mi apparently minor ones, or at least have been considered minor in the past, but are becoming less and less minor. Um, and I'm going to cover a couple of, of what these issues might be, um, two of the biggies um, here, and explain what Vulkan does to get around that. And one of the main ones is stuttering. So in case you're not familiar with what stuttering is, um, it's the short periods of application and responsiveness. So whenever you're using uh, an application and you're trying to input something and it just suddenly stops responding for like half a second or whatever. And there's a lot of things that can cause it. Um, and unfortunately, one of them can actually be the graphics API. Or more strictly, it's actually implementations of that API. The API itself doesn't necessarily deliberately try to its way to cause stutters, but because applications do the wrong thing, not necessarily by choice, sometimes they're forced into that by the API, drivers for those applica uh, applications try to do the right thing by correcting it. And there's a lot of ambiguity and impl implicit stuff within the OpenGLES specification that lets drivers do this. Uh, OpenGLES sort of works pretending, I guess, that, that everything happens in a particular order, which is very close to, well, originally OpenGL was written as a software render, to put things in perspective, um, and whilst there was the idea of a server and client from the start, um, it was all supposed to be that you had one thread that was doing the submission and one that was doing the rendering in the exact order that you specified everything. Unfortunately, graphics cards, GPUs, don't actually necessarily agree with that. Um, I mean, the traditional OpenGLES view is that you sort of, I believe, it's kind of hard to read this, but it's Painter's algorithm. You meant to assume that everything happens, and then the next thing happens, and the next thing happens to completion. And each of those is an individual unit. The whole thing happens in one go. Whereas <clears throat> on GPUs are pipelined, so you'd end up doing things like uh, running vertex tasks for one draw at the same time as running fragment tasks for a previous draw. And the granularity of that depends on which architecture you're on. This is a particular bad problem for VR. Um, there's a lot of research out there and, and papers on things that break immersion or uh, disrupt your senses or give your brain conflicting information. Uh, within the study of VR because all these things can lead to nausea and headaches and one of them is, is stuttering um, <clears throat> and there's a lot of effort in, in trying to get rid of that um, and it's still really annoying in other places uh, if you're using a UI app where you're trying to input something quickly and say you type 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 and all of a sudden oh it stopped typing you're waiting for a second not sure if you made a spelling mistake and you wait and then all of a sudden you realize you've typed five garbage characters and have to delete and stuff again and it's a pain and then of course there's input lag in twitch multiplayer games like first person shooters or MOBA games where you, every sort of split second counts and all of a sudden ah i don't know what's happening because my game is just locked up and that could be down to you know network lag or whatever else but there is also the equal possibility that it's happening on your own machine via um like from the uh, graphics implementation. So there's a few things that cause this, and they're all, you will notice a common theme um, of why, and <clears throat> hopefully you'll be able to see that. Uh, so the first one I'm going to touch on is texture uploading. So in OpenGL, yes, very simple, GL text subimage 2D uploads data to a, to a texture. Seems straightforward enough. But when does the data actually get uploaded to your texture? 
Um, it's probably not when you think it is. Uh, it's sort of implied that, I mean, that function returns immediately. The data you pass to it, unless you're using pixel buffers, is immediately returned to the application. Because it's owned by the CPU, the GP, the, the driver implementation can't just take it and hold it for a while. It needs to return control back to the, GP, uh, the CPU. So it either has to stall the GPU while it waits for that data upload to happen, or it has to do something clever. And the answer in most cases is it does something clever. It's usually deferred until the first time you use it. Um, it obviously depends on your implementation exactly what happens, but a lot of implementations um, take the path of the first time a draw call or something else references it. So you get this idea of uh, pre-warming, um, where an engine in particular or certain applications will upload a texture and they know actually my driver is unlikely to have actually uploaded that yet. So what I'll do is I will pre-warm it by doing a dummy draw call, it's off screen, so it doesn't actually do any GPU work, or very little GPU work, but it does reference the texture. In fact, that's even in our own performance recommendations to do that. Um, and there's a few reasons to do this. Some of the, I mean, the first two really are work batching. If you've got a lot of small um, texture uploads like you might do for a sprite map, then you, a GP may want to batch those up for, for efficiency reasons. And the usual reason is badly paved applications as well. Um, you'd be surprised at the number of applications we've seen coming our way that do things like upload a texture, clear that texture, upload more data to that texture without doing anything else. It's, it's kind of a bit bananas that we actually see that kind of stuff. But we work around that because it's nonsensical to upload and clear twice when you're completely overwriting the results. And it's not necessarily that straightforward and clear cut. There's other sort of more in obvious reasons. It's not like every application is stupid. There are, there are plenty of apparently decent, well uh, written applications according to the API that don't map very well to the hardware and that's the implementation the driver has to mess things up a bit, I guess. Do some shenanigans to, to make it work well. Uh, in a similar vein text, uh, to texture uploads is shader compilation, um, although there are some differences. So compilation, when you do it, doesn't necessarily happen when you think it is. Again, it may be deferred until first use, same as texture upload. Um, there's also other stuff that implementations might do, like have threaded compilation. So they might take uh, your source code, copy it into another buffer and or memory allocation and actually have a compilation thread and they'll do uh, the compile on multiple other threads in order to um, speed up your main thread. And it's possible to do this as an as, a, as an application, but it's kind of, it's got a lot of overhead, it's quite hard to manage, and a lot of that, you, if you look at my last webinar, or my blog post, in fact, uh, you'll see some of the reasons for this. Um, in fact, because it was identified as a problem, they, they did actually come up with a an extension for this, as I've got on the slide here, to actually explicitly enable it um, in your driver. But even if you don't, it's probably it is likely to be still there. There's other stuff as well, like some uh, compilation isn't actually possible until the draw call hits. Uh, almost every implementation does some form of patching. Um, our Power VR uh, implementation doesn't have fixed function blending, so we patch blend state onto the end of a shader. Um, and that requires doing some amount of patching or compilation at the time you see a draw call. And that's not even the, just once, that, that can happen every time you change blend state, for instance. Uh, another one, slightly slightly different, but still very similar theme, um, is draw call submission. So flushing draw calls through the hardware is quite bad. Um, the startup and shutdown cost for doing any GP work can be quite high, um, and whether that, that that that's somewhat platform dependent, somewhat architecture dependent, but in general, it's it's a bad idea to not batch stuff. So implementations tend to basically use their own command buffers. They'll buffer up a series of draw calls into this big command buffer, and then they'll eventually trigger some sort of submission. And it's that eventually uh, eventual trigger that's not completely obvious that it causes problems. So let's say you've got a bunch of frame buffers being rendered to in your scene, and the first one you draw doesn't actually get consumed until the last one you draw. So 
uh, several implementations may not actually submit those first draw calls to that first frame buffer because it knows nothing's waiting on it until it gets to the very end of the frame and goes, ah, actually, maybe I should submit that now, and then submits the whole lot. Now, that's a slightly weird example. There are more complicated cases because in that one, that's actually sort of roughly what we want you to invoke as well. Um, but it sort of goes to show that you don't actually necessarily know where your draw calls are happening. I mean, for instance, in um, in, in OpenGLS, usually you do ZDOS swap buffers every frame. And as such, because it's there and it's an explicit synchron semi-explicit synchronization thing, um, every, almost every driver is going to have to do work when that hits. Whereas if you do something like in VR where you've got front buffer rendering, then it's less clear what you actually need to do. Um, but then you end up relying on uh, finish and flush mechanisms, I guess, or EGL fencings or whatever else you need to do. But it, the, the fact is it's not necessarily obvious what you should be doing. Another biggie is memory tracking. Um, so in OpenGLS or other APIs, it's not completely obvious how much memory you're using. It might seem like you may be able to measure it, um, say from figuring out how many textures you've created and how big they are, more formal they are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you might even find proprietary tools can help you tell you how much memory something's consumed. Um, but again, drivers do, do shenanigans because of this whole implicit stuff that's in OpenGLS and other APIs. It means that the drivers will sometimes consume extra memory in order to boost performance. And it, if you actually consume too much memory, uh, there is the possibility that the operating system may kill you, uh, particularly on mobile, like Android, and um, it will ter terminate your process if your memory consumption gets too high. Um, and even if the OS doesn't, an application might just terminate it itself because, oh, I've seen an out of memory error. Uh, well, I don't know how to recover from that and then just terminate. Or it may do some amount of recovery, but it, it's hard to actually do. You, you wouldn't be able to see a seamless transition. It wouldn't just not appear. It's going to do something on your screen if that happens. So, uh, ghosting is a good example of this. Um, so, we've covered before in other webinars and hopefully. If you've been following any of our Power BI blog, you've probably seen this a number of times. The GPU runs asynchronously to the CPU, and I vaguely covered it earlier. Um, so there's this scenario. How do you handle it if you see a draw command and upload to that to a texture that that draw uses, and then another draw command to that using that texture, and then another upload to that texture, and so on and so forth? So there's dependencies between each of those draws and uploads. Um, and if everything was serialized and running synchronously, that would be fine. You just do the draw, do the upload, draw the draw, do the draw, do the upload. But as I mentioned earlier, when you do an upload, you return that data pointer back to the application immediately. So the CPU memory that was being used is probably being overwritten by the app. It might not be, but we don't know that. There's no way to know that. So when you do the next draw, it's got to have that memory somewhere. Trouble is, when you do that upload, the draw you've just asked to be submitted, which is using that texture, probably has not executed yet. And so in order to actually make that perform well, um, well, in, in order to make it work, there's two options. There's either flush everything between each one, which we've already said is very bad, or you make, again, some sort of driver magic. And what we usually do is ghosting. Um, so this is where you take that uploading, the data to be uploaded, and you store it in a temporary buffer. So you actually do a copy when you see the GLTEX subimage 2D. But you don't uh, copy it to the main texture that you're actually aiming at. You copy it to some other temporary buffer, which will then be consumed later on the GPU between those two draw calls. And depending on how that can be implemented in a number of ways, you might see that as just random floating memory with that data, or you might see that as a whole other copy of the texture in some cases. Um, if you take a look at the blog post that I've linked there, you may want to screenshot this because I haven't put it on the links, um, and I'll probably forget to do that again. Um, so I'll leave this slide up for a second. Um, that blog post actually goes into detail of how to, oh, that's a strange link. I think that's the right post. I will have to double check at the end, but I believe that's a blog post on, on how this stuff sort of works on PowerPoint GPUs and how to actually make it more efficient. But, Ideally, we don't really want to tell you that on a per vendor basis. I mean, it may be that that 
is actually appro appropriate for many vendors. Um, but really, we want the API to express that rather than letting you blindly go draw, upload, draw, upload, draw, upload, and thinking everything's fine. So Vulkan is explicit, as I've said many, many times. Um, and the whole point is to ask the application exactly what they want. So unlike OpenGLS, there's, there's very few implicit dependencies. And when I say very few, I mean really, really very few. Um, <clears throat> there's not really anything that synchronizes with everything else. Uh, there's a few things that will synchronize with certain other commands. For instance, when you set some state, it would be kind of annoying to have to have a depend, like an explicit dependency between setting that state and actually doing a draw call. So when you do a pipeline, you set a pipeline, you're going to then use that on the next draw call that you submit to, which have a command buffer. Um, and there's various other bits that would be awkward to make explicit, but it's never going to be the case that you don't want those things to happen. So that, that's usually what happens is it's implicit if there's no case, a good case for it being explicit. Um, but almost everything has a good case for being explicit. So there's a lot of features within Vulkan that are explicit, and each one is, is useful to an extent, but you need all, all of them, really, um, along with some of the other incidental features in the API to actually solve the aforementioned issues, along with other issues that I have not covered. So resource allocation. Um, it's a lot different to what you see in OpenGLS. So OpenGLS is one call to allocate, create and allocate a texture. Um, I'm ignoring the sort of gen textures and bind textures um, because they don't really do very much. And if you have DSA, for instance, on uh, gel, that's that's gone. Um, but you, the broad stroke of it is that you allocate and you allocate it with a call to gel text image 2D or gel text storage 2D. <coughs> Excuse me, and that's a very simple, oh, look, it's done it. Don't have to worry too much about it. Uh, in Vulkan, you actually have to go the long way around. So you will create an image object with all your properties you want. But then you have to query the object for its memory requirements. So you don't start with any memory allocated for an image. I mean, there may be some CPU allocation or some basic allocation for the actual state of the image. But the actual uh, data part of that image will not be allocated. So you have to query for memory requirements uh, and then actually look on the system for some memory that meets those requirements, allocate it, and then bind that memory to the image. And all of those are explicit steps within Vulkan. And these aren't trivial. Um, <clears throat> so one thing that Vulkan also doesn't do for you is it tries not to get in your way or do any clever strategies with allocation when you call uh, allocate, it's going to allocate from the system exactly what you've asked for and it's not going to try and be clever and do any sort of memory pools, or at least it shouldn't do. Obviously, we can't completely stop implementations for doing cleverness, but that's the idea and everyone seems to be on board with it. But what this does mean is, is it's up to the application to be clever instead. Um, so very simple apps, it's kind of okay to just do one allocation per resource. But for something complicated like a game engine or, or a game, in fact, um, or anything with a lot of graphical, a lot of resources in it, um, you really want to be considering sub allocation. So you might want to, instead of allocating one image and then allocating one memory object for it, you probably want to batch them up. So you do a large um, memory allocation. You would keep track of what's in that memory allocation yourself and sub allocate from it. So every time you have a new image, you just sort of take a little sub allocation from that chunk of memory and bind it to the to the image. So it's a range of memory binding, not necessarily a whole thing. And it's quite important to do this for, for bigger apps. It's actually possible on some platforms that if you have too many allocations, uh, it can actually fail to allocate. And that's not because of an out of memory issue. There are, there are other more subtle issues. I believe, I, I, well, I'm not actually sure what they are because I think it's mostly Windows, but there are other platforms that may have issues too. Um, so, and, and that can actually happen well before you actually run out of memory. So it's very important to, to consider this. Data transfer is another one. Um, so data transfer is pipeline, sort of. Um, so if your average buffer and sort of linear textures, I guess what you might consider a texture buffer, well, no, they're, they're linear code too. Um, 
So, so there's, there's two types of images. You've got some images that are in um, a tiled format of some description, some sort of optimal format for the platform. And there's other ones which are just basically buffers, but got in an image, uh, as an image, so that they, the layout of memory is completely linear, the same as you might see in a bitmap or whatever. It'll, it'll just go in row order. <clears throat> and for linear images and for buffers, you can just map memory directly to the CPU and write data in. Um, <clears throat> or um, you can copy from other resources. So if you have a, uh, say, a, a, a discrete graphics card where your final memory is actually in a different location and not accessible from the CPU, you might stage it in some linear memory that's accessible to the CPU and then copy it to the actual discrete memory. And you also would do this for any opaque um, textures as well, any opaque memory format textures. So if you don't know what's in there, then you let the hardware actually handle doing that transition for you. And the steps are roughly as I put there, you create and bind memory to a buffer, as described in the previous slide, um, and then you might persistently map that to the host. You don't have to persistently map, you can map or unmap, but persistent is usually better if you're going to do it multiple times. Um, and then you can read the image data from your desk straight into that memory. There's no need to copy it into some other host pointer and then into that. You can go straight from disk to that memory. And then you'll uh, have a command that goes into a command buffer and gets submitted to the DP to actually copy that data to the image from that buffer. And <clears throat> all of this is not, again, implicitly uh, dependent on each other. You will have to synchronize all this yourself. Um, especially if you're doing resource streaming, you'll have to handle multi-buffering um, and all sorts of other stuff because you've got multiple threads of multiple processes accessing the same data at the same time, potentially. So speaking of synchronization, it is important. Uh, as I already mentioned, very little is implicitly synchronized. Um, and, and there's good reasons for this. Uh, different GPUs execute in different orders. so. Um, a tile-based architecture like ours will do all of its vertex work first so that you can get the um, vertex bin vertices binned into tiles, uh, whereas an immediate mode renderer um, will <coughs> more likely just pipeline everything. So you'll go, you'll see a draw call, you start the vertex work, and then it will move on to its fragment work. And whilst doing that, the next draw call will come along and start its vertex work, and then do its fragment work, and so on and so forth. And that order is, again, slightly different to what it's actually stated in OpenGL ES. And because of the lack of ordering in the API, it allows us to do much more efficient execution of things. Um, if you actually need a dependency, which is actually only in a few places in a lot of cases, unless you're doing something clever, in which case you might need more, um, then it, you get a lot more, uh, Sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Uh, let me try again. So the application, you have to specify dependencies yourself. Um, you shouldn't need to specify too many of them. Um, there's hazards everywhere that you might care to put stuff in different threads. Um, but for the most part, it, it's quite straightforward. You can just put dependencies between the things that need to actually execute. Um, because draw calls are grouped into render passes, that makes things slightly easier. But the whole point is it allows much better tuning of your performance. Um, so if you see that there's some overlap between different processes, then great, you've done it well. If you see there is an overlap and you've got some process or idling, then you can go and investigate and figure out exactly where the synchronization points you you put in are that are causing the problem. Obviously, it gets tricky to debug, to debug because rate conditions and hazards are quite tricky to debug. Um, but it is a bit of a double-edged sword, as I'll talk a bit more in a minute. Work submission, so this is my favorite topic. Command generation is separate from submission. I kind of feel like I sound like a parrot whenever I say that because I've said it so many times because it's so good for so many reasons. Um, the last two topics, uh, also the uh, last two, sorry, the last two webinars both covered this as well. <clears throat> so the whole point here is the draw commands have no effect on the GPU. Um, you don't start rendering anything when you call BK command draw, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it just records into command buffer. You have to then take those command buffers and explicitly submit them to the GPU via a queue submission. And until you've actually done that, no rendering will occur. And that is the only thing that can, in fact, trigger that rendering. It's just a single entry point, one, one way to do it and no other way, and nothing else can trigger it. And you can also get notifications uh, via the synchronization objects in the API about when it's actually completed as well. So that can be quite handy um, 
for a lot of reasons. And this is a topic that I, I'm going to cover briefly now um, because it's quite a lot of detail in it and I will try to cover that more in my final webinar where I'll be talking about um, render parsers quite a bit because I'll be talking about how Vulkan maps to Power VR hardware. So <clears throat> mid-render flashes, so what do I mean by that? So if you start a frame buffer, you start drawing to it, um, at the start of rendering a tiled architecture will want to load data into the tile buffers um, so they can start rendering it against it. So when you do a clear, it's going to clear a color, um, and that clear color needs to make it to on-chip memory, um, and you need to be able to render into that. And if you, and when you get to the end, you will then store it, and if you haven't said any otherwise, OpenGLX assumes you're going to store all of those tiles into their relevant render targets, which costs a lot of bandwidth. Um, if anyone uses discard frame buffer or invalidate frame buffer in ES3 onwards, Good on you, first of all. And secondly, that is what sort of signals a tiler to go, right, I don't need this data, just discard it. I don't need it storing off. And it saves a lot of bandwidth doing that. Trouble is, if you do, if you actually cause a flush in the middle of that uh, frame buffer, OpenGLS doesn't really have any mechanism for saying what you want to do with that data at that point. And it's not necessarily obvious what causes those flushes. So in the typical case, what will end up happening is that a tiler will just have to load and store every single buffer. And that's a whole big bandwidth cost you weren't necessarily encounter, encountering on. Luckily, it doesn't happen enormously in the wild. It doesn't happen too often, but it does happen. So Vulkan actually delimits these renders um, and has explicit specification of the low store ops. So you can tell it exactly what you want to do at the start of rendering and exactly what you want to do at the end of rendering and you're not allowed to flush in the middle of that which means that we always 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 know what you're going to do with that tile memory at the start and end of day and you avoid this situation and it means the application has to actually think about that um, you if you want to really cause a mid render flush you're gonna to have to tell us what you want to do and do two render passes you have to manually split the render pass and tell us exactly what you want to do and Honestly, if you do multiple, too many render passes, if you wanted to flush between every draw, that's going to be bad for a number of reasons. But even on IMRs, that's not going to be great. Um, so hopefully, the API informs you a little bit about what you should be doing. It, it just gets you thinking, basically. And like I said, I'll, I'll cover more about this in my final webinar. So Vulkan does provide a lot of explicit mechanisms. And, these are all hidden or just far too coarse in older APIs. And so it's not necessarily bad application behavior, it's just that you couldn't necessarily express what you wanted in, in older APIs. So sometimes it's a bit of both. Um, by being explicit, it's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. So you've got more expressiveness, you can potentially get a much better performance and it's easier to tune it to have better performance. But you are forced into doing this. It's not like there's a choice. Um, I know, for instance, like Metal, has actually got a developer choice whether you want um, implicit or explicit um, signalization, and you, you can choose that. So you can start off in one mode and move transition to another mode later if you feel comfortable with it. With Vulkan, there's no such safety net. You will start in the explicit mode, and that's just where you are, where you are, and that's all you've got. Um, a typical way of doing this will be to start with being very conservative to make sure you get correct rendering and then as you get closer and closer to release to actually pare down some of these dependencies and debug on various targets to make sure you've got all the dependencies you need but it can be hard to get right um, and this will make performance tuning tools very very important um, I mean in OpenGLES yes there's a lot of issues and yes there's a lot of implicit dependencies but by and large the driver will will try and make your application perform as well as it possibly can, which is, like I said, a lot of driver shenanigans, but it does mean that that help the driver was giving you is no longer there. If you do something wrong, if you upload texture three times in a row, the driver will have to upload three times in a row. It's gonna be very rare that the driver's gonna be able to intervene and go, hold on, you're doing something wrong, I'm just gonna stop you. Um, that's not the aim of Vulcan, the aim of Vulcan is to do what you tell it to. Um, if, if a driver really wants to do that sort of determination, it's going to have to do it on a per-app basis, and it's going to have to be damn sure that it knows what the app is doing. And that's the end of the talk. So, um, as usual, I will stay on for a couple of minutes if anyone has any questions. Uh, QA out.
which will load this a while ago. So yeah, if anyone's got any questions, oh, there we go, I've got one already. Um, feel free to post more uh, if anyone has any. Uh, right, so I will answer this question now. How much control on Vulkan API we could expect from OEMs? Does Vulkan get features, extensions, standardized or mandatory for all of those that implement Vulkan drivers? Or could potentially there be situations where some vendors won't include particular extensions? Right. Um, did I cover this one already a bit? I think I covered this slightly in my first talk. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll be, I mean, there's some level of standardization. I mean, from a core point of view, Vulkan has a bunch of optional features and there's a bunch of extensions. Um, and none of them are mandatory in the core API, of course, because otherwise there's no point in them being optional. They may as well be non-optional. Um, what I did briefly touch on is the idea that we, we've kind of agreed that there's this concept of a feature set that um, an OEM may express. So, for instance, um, any platform that has a windowing system that wants to ship Vulkan is likely to <laughs> mandate that you have all the relevant window system APIs. Um, so there's been a lot of work on that with a lot of platforms to make sure that that all works. Um, and then they may also mandate various other and like uh, platform specific uh, extensions, much like uh, you see on OpenGLS with uh, Android's extension pack to ES 3.1. Um, but beyond that, the situation is basically the same as OpenGLS. Um, you know, if a driver wants to implement an extension, that's up to that driver, unless they have external forces telling them otherwise. Um, I, yeah, I don't think it's going to really be any different from that. Um, we've, we've got slightly more awareness of that now, is all I would say. Okay, I will hang around for a minute if anyone else has any other questions. any more questions um, I think unless anything comes in while I'm talking that is it from me um, if you do have any questions that you come up with later or you're watching this on YouTube and have any questions feel free to post in the comments or you can contact me on Twitter at Topsky Hektov or you can post on the blog post when it goes live as well which should hopefully be tomorrow but possibly next week at this point oh there is been another question uh, right Will Vulkan support fixed point arithmetic? Um, are you thinking in terms of CPU operations, like uh, older versions of OpenGLS, or are you thinking in terms of uh, like shading operations? I, I can answer either. Um, I will answer both, in fact, save you having to type anymore. Um, so uh, for in terms of uh, CPU operations, no. Uh, that's been left in the past. There's no support for that at all, because there's no platforms that demand it anymore. Um, in terms of GPU operation, uh, to an extent, um, you've got these, uh, the idea of unsigned normalized textures, for instance, and that will be supported uh, forever, I guess, or at least for the foreseeable future. Um, but beyond that, no, not really anything else. Oh, it's worth pointing out that um, because Vulcan is so low level, we are sort of hoping and probably will push ourselves for high level sort of abstractions on top of it. Um, so you may see some fixed point maths thing going on on top, but the API itself won't support it. Um, so as I was, as I was saying, um, yeah, if you have any questions, one of those channels is a great way to get in contact. It might take me a few days to get back to you, but I will try and get back to you eventually. I do try to keep track of these things, um, but we are in the middle of uh, you know, finalizing Vulcan, so it's, I'm quite busy at the moment, unfortunately, but I will try to get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, thank you.